Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. Guys, there is so much news today that this is likely going to be the longest daily update that I've ever done. So sit back, get cozy, stick with me because I have a lot to talk about today. A lot of this stuff and analysis you're probably not going to hear anywhere else. So let's just jump right into it. We got to talk about everything from the Pope declaring World War III, possible cyber attacks on U.S. critical infrastructure. We got supply chain issues out the yin yang. We got the market in free fall. We got the crypto crash. We got everything and some. So let's just jump right in. Now let's start at something tame, okay? We're going to get progressively worse as we go through the video. Uh, this is very tame. This is just a local, you know, this is Saskatchewan Health Authority, the province I live in. They sent out this memo to a lot of their employees about supply chain disruptions. And to me, this is like two years too late. But basically, they're saying in this letter that they're addressing to uh, their employees, of which I used to be one, that uh, you need to start rationing stuff, okay? Because things are going to get weird. And the hospitals are full right now, which is weird because, you know, they should have been full before. Anyways, they're full right now. There's a lot of people. Uh, we talked about this before. Is it because people uh, didn't get those uh, assessments uh, prior, you know, during the pandemic? And, you know, a lot of people maybe were out of shape throughout the pandemic and, you know, a lot of health problems right now, okay? So they are looking at strategies that include consideration for alternate available inventory options as a substitute conservation of existing stock by end users where possible, setting order quantity limits in the allocation of stock based on customer short term needs, explore potential care practice changes in the absence of any product or substitute alternatives. They're basically saying that global supply chains have been significantly impacted due to a surge in demand for consumer goods, labor shortages within the freight, transportation industry, port closures, etc., etc., many raw material constraints. Industry experts expect that this bottleneck will continue for the foreseeable future. Tell us something we don't know. Just wanted to let you guys know that this is local for those of my Saskatchewan viewers, a couple of which I've met today. It seems like every day I'm meeting people who are watching the channel. And as much as I like to go incognito, uh, it's, it's nice to meet people too. So you know, shout out to you guys. Anyways, where do we start here today? Okay, so World War III has been declared according to Pope Francis, Pope Francis has suggested that World War III is already in progress as evidenced by the intertwined elements at work in the Russia-Ukraine crisis. A few years ago, it occurred to me to say that we are experiencing a third world war fought piecemeal, he said. Today for me, World War III has officially been declared. Francis noted that while fighting in Ukraine pricks our sensibilities more, wars are also ongoing in places like northern Nigeria, Myanmar, and nobody cares. And those are just the ones that... Let's face it, nobody cares about. Uh, I'm not saying I don't care about them, it's just that we don't hear about them. We don't hear about them like we hear about the Syria conflict or the, the Asia conflicts. So it's happening. I'm simply against turning a complex situation into a distinction between good guys and bad guys without considering the roots and self-interest, which are very complex. And he said that as a response to his criticism that uh, he was go going a little too easy on Vladimir Putin. So. Anyways, if you, if you didn't know yet, we're in World War III, and the Pope just affirmed that. Uh, France has entered a war economy, according to Emmanuel Macron. He says that France has entered into a war economy in which I believe we will find ourselves for a long time. He said this during the opening of the Euro Satori Arms Expo in Paris. And as we discussed it a couple days ago, Germany is planning on sending a missile defense system to Ukraine, but not until October. So that should give you a sense of how long this thing is going to stretch on. We're talking, you know, winter, we're talking 2023, possibly 2024. So every country in Europe and the world for that matter is arming up. Now, an ex prime minister of Russia says that Putin is out of it and the Ukraine war could last two years. So Kasyanov, who was Russia's prime minister from the year 2000 to 2004, said he expected the war could last up to two years, but he was convinced Russia could turn to a democratic path. He predicted that the war could last up to two years and that it was imperative that Ukraine won. Now, he's obviously... Um, opposed to Putin and 
I'm not sure if he was exiled or if he's still in Russia or not, but he says that if Ukraine falls, the Baltic states will be next. So he's one of these people who believe that uh, the Russian goal is to bring back the old Soviet empire, if you want to call it that. He also rebuffed calls for Ukraine to cede territory to end the war. So he doesn't think that the secession of territory is going to end the war, which makes me think that this guy has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. Here's the thing. <clears throat> now that the Russians have taken territory, they're never going to give it back. I mean, I regret to inform you that if the Ukrainians could not defend the territory with the advantages that they had in being dug in and just having that uh, defender to offender, that the, the usual advantage that you have in war, there's no way they're going to be able to take it back. At least I don't think so. Maybe if they get some more long range missile systems and they start bringing in the big guns, which apparently they are. I was talking to a friend uh, just in text yesterday and he said that there's a lot of movement in uh, some military bases in the United States where they're starting to now ship not the expired stuff, but, but the good stuff, okay? Now, <clears throat> why is this so important? Well, apparently a Russian village was shelled from Ukraine. Now, this is not new. This is something that has been happening throughout the war. But Russia recently explicitly stated that if you use the missiles that the U.S. is supplying you, the medium to long-range missiles, then we are going to start targeting what they call the decision decision making centers which we we have to assume is either in kiev or outside of kiev in poland uh, warsaw potentially even the united states even though i don't think we're, we're that close to world war three just yet but we're, we're definitely getting there now this town that they hit was 45 kilometers from the ukrainian border so it would have required a, a longer, a medium range missile. And Moscow has previously warned that if they do this, then there's gonna be a response. So you can bet that there's probably going to be a response to this. Now this story actually came out more than 24 hours ago and I wasn't sure about it, but it, it has been confirmed. So is what it is. Now uh, I wanna talk about more, we're gonna get back into more war stuff in a bit. But I first have to talk about this because this is just really suspicious, okay? Now, Freeport Liquid Natural Gas, uh, what would you call it, like a factory, uh, has extended an outage after fire. Now, this factory, a facility, I guess you would call it, produces about 20% of the U.S. liquid national gas exports. And of course, as you know, this is what Europe is relying on to make up for that which cannot be provided by Russia due to the sanctions. Now, one of the largest operators of liquefied natural gas export terminals in the United States on Tuesday said the damage from last week's fire at its Texas plant would keep it fully offline until September with only partial operation through to the year's end. 20%, okay? Now, think about this. Now, they're saying that the fire was caused by a breach in pressured pipes that transfer LNG from storage dock facilities. Okay. Uh, does that start to look like that could potentially have been a cyber attack to you? I mean, we, we know that Russia did that cyber attack on the gas plant back in 2021, or at least there was good evidence to support that they were responsible for that. Uh, was this a cyber attack? I mean, because think about it. Liquid natural gas. Okay, uh, if there was ever any type of, of critical infrastructure that you would target to send a message to Europe, that would be where you send it. Now, are we ever going to admit to these things? Are we ever going to, uh, be, because if we were to admit to something like this, would that be showing our weaknesses? You know, would they cover something like this up if it was a cyber attack? because they don't want to admit that the Russians got one past them. I don't know, or was it sabotage? Or was it just a fluke that the one thing that the world needs right now, most liquid natural gas um, has now been, been uh, reduced to the tune of 20%. So European day ahead gas prices jumped 11.6% to 90% euros per megawatt hour after initially spiking as much as 21 percent and the 
one of the uh, consultants and the directors of the natural gas at LNG said that it's very serious. We now have a much larger and much more extensive outage at Freeport LNG that will remove more supply from the market than was originally anticipated. So the price of that gas is going to go up, meaning that Europe, Europe is screwed. I mean, every which way from Sunday, Europe is screwed. And you know why? Because on top of that, Russia has now slashed gas flows to the EU by 40%. Okay, so Gazprom deliveries via the Nord Stream 1 pipeline were curtailed after Siemens, which is a German company, failed to return pumping units from repair for repair on time, Gazprom has reported, which is the major uh, Russian natural gas company. Russian state gas exporter Gazprom announced on Tuesday that it was reducing gas deliveries via Nord Stream and that the planned volume of deliveries at 167 million cubic meters uh, down to reducing the flow down to 100 million. That is incredible. Gas prices only spiked 11% on the news, which I think is surprising, drawing close to $1,000 per cubic meters. Of course, the price of natural gas, I don't know what is it, like 400% what it was just a few years ago. So I wanted to get that story out of the way because to me, that's very, very fishy to have a liquid natural gas facility, one of the biggest in the United States, suddenly go offline until the end of the year. Uh, conveniently, you know, around the time when the Ukrainian counteroffensive is supposed to start, which is just going to, I mean, it, it could be chaos this fall and winter in Europe, which is why they're giving people in Poland a heads up. Hey, you know, we might not be able to provide you with natural gas this winter, so feel free to cut down the forest if you need to. That's, a, that's what they've said. We talked about this about a couple weeks ago. Um, I don't know if it was... Uh, like a public announcement, but basically they're relaxing some environmental laws to allow people to uh, heat their homes with wood and <laughs> see how long, you know, the forest lasts if you have millions of people who rely on more efficient condensed form of energy like natural gas going into the forest uh, like lumberjacks. It ain't going to last that long and people will find that out real quick. I mean, they deforested Britain in a time before chainsaws. So just imagine what will happen right now. Anyways, uh, as for uh, some updates on the war in Ukraine, I'm gonna tell you what I know from a person who seems to be relatively in the know, but take this all with a grain of salt, okay? Now, of course, arrests have continued of Ukrainian citizens who are apparently uh, using social media to send the Russians intel. Okay, and they're cracking down on this pretty hard. Uh, both Ukraine and Russia have shut down internet and mobile phone services over wide areas, including the confiscation of TV and internet satellite dishes on the Ukrainian side. We talked about that yesterday. Anywhere near combat zones, including as far west as Odessa. Now, Starlink was apparently uh, assisting the Ukrainians in decrypting some of these messages which were being sent by these moles in Ukraine to Russia, supposedly. And uh, so it's interesting to see how, you know, this Starlink technology is being leveraged in that respect. Uh, this source says that Ukrainian public statements about these matters have been unreliable and official Russian statements about the progress of, of war are so vague and tardy that they are close to useless. And this is what you're seeing. You're seeing Russia have these very vague strategic explanations, which are so general they're, they don't really provide you any information whatsoever. And then you have on the flip side of that, Ukrainians seemingly showing every single, you know, successful battle they engage in, of course, showing none of their losses, because this is what you have to do from an art of war perspective. You need to appear strong when you are weak. And the Russians perhaps are doing the other, doing the opposite, that they're appearing weak when they are in fact strong. We're going to have Dr. Peter Pry back on the channel at the end of June, and he's going to give his updated assessment of what's going on there. So far, that guy's been bang on right on the money. And uh, if you haven't seen that interview we did with him yet, it's got over 300,000 views. Uh, very in-depth. You're going to learn a lot about nuclear weapons and uh, the U.S. strategy as it pertains to them. And uh, he was ex-CIA, so, you know, take it for what it's worth, right? The U.S. and NATO, mostly Turkey, have deployed continuous surveillance 
by high altitude drones, Q4 Global Hawks, just outside the southern and western borders of the combat zone. And yet Ukrainians seem to only rarely be able to strike Russian force concentrations. Now this is important. Instead, the Ukrainians resort to attacking broad fixed targets like city centers. The conclusion is, his tentative conclusion, is that the NATO standoff remote sensing surveillance mission is not working. Now, I think it's clear to, well, I shouldn't say it's clear, but a lot of people are suspecting that this Ukrainian war is being used as a testing ground by both the Russians and the US military. And this is what Dr. Peter Pry talked about. He talked about how uh, the Russians are, are testing NATO's weaknesses, okay? And the more weapons that the US sends to Ukraine, uh, the more the Russians are able to learn about what the weaknesses of these weapon systems are and find workarounds to these systems. And so, you know, when you're Russia and you have, you know, a virtually unlimited supply of uh, military men and conscripts, because they have historically one of the, you know, it's Russia, right? They have one of the largest populations in Europe. So that's always been their thing is uh, dispensability of human resources. So, you know, they can test this stuff at any cost. And uh, yeah, apparently now the Russian government mentioned that it's going to deploy high altitude surveillance drones to Ukraine for the first time. On Tuesday, the Russian MOD claimed that 280 positions of Ukrainian force concentrations were attacked over the last 24 hours. If this tempo continues at this level, it's hard to see how Ukrainian forces now, almost always on defense, can continue combat operations, which is why Zelensky is pleading with the world for more weapons and bigger weapons. Now, on the topic of grain shipments out of Ukraine, this guy says that Russia announced today that the country expects a record high wheat harvest in the next couple weeks, or in the next few weeks, and will be able to increase exports from 37 million tons to 50 million, 50 million tons, providing sanctions are lifted. Are sanctions going to be lifted? No. Sanctions are likely not going to be lifted. There's no reason why they would lift sanctions at this time. Uh, it's just not going to happen. There is apparently no further discussion on the sea mine clearance to free the port of Odessa, but he thinks that's redundant because he thinks that Russia is just going to be able to fill the gap left by Ukraine. I'm not so confident about that. Okay. Now, moving southward from there, Israel has reiterated a firm warning to all Israelis to leave Turkey, okay? Now the recommendation is not limited to just one Turkish city, but the whole country. Things are heating up between Iran and Turkey. Multiple Iranian, uh, the Israeli government's directive raises many questions as Israel admits that there are multiple Iranian terrorist cells operating in Turkey, implying that there is an erosion of Turkish services. Remember, Turkey's got some wild inflation going on. They're talking about doing an invasion into uh, northern Syria. They're in this uh, debacle with Greece over these islands, Aegean islands. And, uh, you know, there's just a lot of turmoil in Turkey. Of course, they're at odds with NATO's wanting to bring uh, Sweden and fin uh, Finland into the fold, so it's not looking good. Israelis visiting Istanbul should leave as soon as possible, Israeli Foreign Minister Yair Lapid said Monday because of Iranian threats. Okay, now to go a step further, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett paid a surprise visit to the Emirates. Both agree to host Israeli military infrastructure as a step towards an ongoing tensions between Tel Aviv and Tehran that are set on a potentially irreversible path to conflict in the region. And so they are deploying military infrastructure, the Israelis, to the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain in the form of radar systems, apparently to deal with an alleged missile threat from nearby Iran. So they're, they're preparing for war with Iran, who has these deep underground military bases where they're warehousing all of their drone technology, their nuclear facilities, and all the rest. I mean, this is something out of a James Bond movie, but it's happening. I mean, it's, the Pope said it, you know. 
So for all you guys, I mean, I know most of my Christian viewers probably <laughs> know that shit's hitting the fan. But uh, if you didn't, then there you go. Now, Lyle Goldstein, okay? He, Goldstein, you know, he means business. The scary war game over Taiwan that the U.S. loses to China again and again. So um, this guy is a U.S. Naval uh, War College laureate, I guess you could say, or what, what would you call him? Um, I don't know. Uh, he's of the U.S. Naval War College, okay? His appraisal is that Taiwan would fold in a week or two in the case of a China war. Now, we've heard this before with Ukraine, which is why I'm not going to put any, not a whole lot of stock, we'll say. But he claims that in these war game exercises, the blue team, which is the United States and Taiwan, generally has its ass handed to it. Okay, David Omanak, a former deputy, deputy assistant secretary of defense for force development and now a defense analyst for the Rand Corporation, said for years the blue team has been in shock because they didn't realize how badly off they were in a confrontation with China. And there is a bill now before the House of Congress, the Taiwan Defense Act, which would end a long-time American-held policy of strategic ambiguity. So it was this idea that, you know, China, if you invade Taiwan, we may do something or we may not. We're not definitive to saying we were because we want to respect, you know, Taiwan as uh, potentially a part of your nation. But we also want to respect Taiwan's sovereignty. So that strategic ambiguity may be going out the window. And that was pretty evident when Biden said explicitly that we would come to Taiwan's aid in a military sense if the shizzy hit the fizzy. Okay. Now, China has, the analysts say, achieved what's called anti-access area denial, A2AD, which would prevent American forces from being able to penetrate anywhere near Taiwan once a war started there. Rand, who have gamed out scenarios, believe a war over Taiwan would most likely begin with a massive attack by advanced Chinese missiles against three American targets, its bases on Okinawa, Okinawa and Guam, its ships in the Western Pacific, including aircraft carrier groups, and its Air Force squadrons in the region. And of course, uh, the Chinese are flexing with their hypersonic missiles. Do they work? Nobody knows. I guess we'll find out soon. But the number of submarines near enough to the battle zones at the time, time of the Chinese strike, these are American submarines, would, analysts say, be around 20 or 25, each armed with about 12 torpedoes and 10 or so harpoon missiles, not nearly enough to overcome China's flood the zone strategy. And remember, if anybody's got manpower, it's the Chinese with 10 times the population of the Russians. And what, 100 times the population of the Australians or 50 times or something? Anti-ship missiles could knock out U.S. carriers and warships. Surface -to air missiles could destroy our fighters and bombers. Now, they're talking a lot about airborne assault in two varieties, by parachute and helicopters. That's called vertical envelopment. Amphibious assault, where the Chinese are expected to, you know, use these amphibious vehicles like it was D-Day or Normandy and storm the beaches, that that is what they call old school. And it may, may be necessary, but it's not the main military effort. The new school is to bring lead elements over by air, secure the terrain, lead elements over by air, secure the terrain, and then bring in more forces over the beach. The intensity and scale of training in the Chinese military now for airborne assault is, to me, shocking. My appraisal is that Taiwan would fold in a week or two. However, you know, we've seen what are, what's happening in Ukraine, you know, and I can only imagine that the place would be completely destroyed. Because by the sounds of things, uh, the Taiwanese are not going to fold easily. And even Taiwan has now threatened to launch a counterattack with supersonic missiles that can reach Beijing. If Taiwan starts shooting Beijing, then Taiwan will be destroyed, unfortunately. Um, it's just a reality. Uh, yes, they, they're on an island and there's a lot of hurdles that the Chinese would have to overcome. But the Chinese have nuclear missiles at the end of the day. Air defense forces shoot down uh, two Russian missiles fired on Odessa. So the Russians are, so the Ukrainians still have some missile defense capability. The Russians are going for Odessa. 
Uh, there's a guy on here, you probably know him, his name's Scott Ritter. I don't attest to everything he says. He's got a past. He's He's been uh, he's been in the mix for a long time, ever since the Iraqi war days. He's got a lot of experience, but he's also got a couple black uh, marks under his name. So just uh, take it with a grain of salt. But anyways, he's been fairly accurate in his predictions so far, and he says that Odessa is next, and that it's only a matter of time before... Uh, Russia goes for Odessa, which is why the Ukrainians have basically said that they're not going to be removing the mines from the sea, that that is a situation which is not going to change. Uh, Anthony Blinken came out Monday at a press conference and uh, he was talking about North Korea and uh, just a look on his face looked very concerned. Like it almost looked like he, he knows that there's a big, big, big war coming. and uh, Or maybe he just didn't get sleep the night before. I don't know. Anyways, he basically affirmed that any North Korean provocations, including a nuclear test, which they're going to do in the next couple of weeks, just watch, will be met with a united and firm response from our alliance in the international community. As North Korea is, ex is suspected to be preparing to conduct its seventh nuclear test in the coming weeks, we continue to see the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. That will never happen. Uh, Russia, as I talked about yesterday, is going to be deploying their military to Nicaragua for humanitarian operations. The pieces are moving into place. Now, how much time do you got left? 26 minutes. We got 22 minutes to get into economics and uh, climate chaos. The market is on the edge of a huge collapse. Now, this is very interesting. Andy Sheckman, president and owner of Miles Franklin Precious Metals, a company that has done more than $5 billion in sales. Okay, This is what he says. Some very smart people who know more than I do speak in terms of an 80% drop in the S&P and Dow. 80%. People are, that's uh, people jumping out of high-rise building weather. Okay, For the last 30 years, I have felt that eventually the Dow and gold will reach a 1 to 1 or 2 to 1 ratio. Now let's explain what he means by that. Currently that ratio is 18 to 1, meaning that 18 ounces of gold will buy the Dow. Basically 18 ounces of gold will buy you, what would that be, like a share of every company within the Dow? Arguably that speaks to massively overvalued stocks and stupidly undervalued gold. And yes, it has happened before, twice in fact. In 1980, gold was 850. I'm not sure, I think that's corrected for inflation. And the Dow was 850. And in the early, and now it's like 30,000, think about that. And in the early 30s, gold was $35, and the Dow was $35. So I would not be shocked to see something like gold and the Dow both priced at $5,000, or gold at $5,000, and the Dow at $10,000. So he's predicting, once again, that we're going to see a huge spike in gold price. And depending on how far the Bitcoin bubble bursts, or how, you know, because once all that money has been liquidated out of the crypto markets, people are going to want to put that money somewhere. And, uh, you know, there's this idealism right now with decentralized currency, cryptocurrency. And I think it's going to happen at some point. We're going to get to that Blade Runner point in our evolution where it's dystopia, but you, you still have, you know, Bitcoin and you still have a decentralized currency. Um, but I think a lot of people might get scared of it if especially if it breaks the previous high that was achieved. I believe it was in, uh, what was it, like 2017 or something like that. And uh, Arthur Hayes observed that Bitcoin is forming a base at 20,000. Now, basically, if it goes under 20,000, that's when people start to hit the panic button. Right now, you have people who bought at that level who are just going to hold on for dear life because, you know, they're... <laughs> They, they're, they're long hodlers, so they're not too worried about what happens in the short term. But a lot of people, a lot of retail money has been already scared out of the market. These are people who are looking for quick returns and uh, possibly 
hedge funds, you know, uh, people who got in at, at a lower rate and just want to get out before it drops. So if it drops, if it continues to drop, then I'm gonna, I think we're gonna see a lot of that money flood back into the gold market, even though the gold market is like 10 times the crypto market now. Remember, the crypto has been, uh, has shed like two trillion in the last two years. So there was a time when crypto was actually catching up to gold at its peak. Crypto was, you know, maybe a third of the international gold market. Now it's about a tenth. So that liquidity, though, has to go somewhere, right? And uh, maybe people are going to buy real estate. Maybe they're going to buy preps. Maybe they're going to buy bunkers. Uh, Brad over at Full Spectrum was talking about how Obama was building a bunker. I'm pretty sure he's got one already, but, you know. And now we are officially in a bear market according to... Well, just according to the statistics, the S&P 500 has slipped below bear market level. So it's officially a bear market. I guess we'll know if it's a recession, depending on whether the next uh, quarter shows us economic contraction. Anyways, this guy says, as far as charts go, you better get out your Lord Satoshi prayer book and hope that the Lord knows kindness on the soul of crypto markets, because if these levels break, you might as well shut down your computer because your charts will be useless for a while. So it's not that the market might not bounce back, but we're in a very si si similar situation to the tech bubble, where if all this war stuff resolves itself, if all these supply chain issues resolve itself, and there's not yet another you know, a pandemic that emerges on the heels of this one. Uh, if, it, if the smoke clears, maybe in 10 years, things will start to normalize again, but they're not gonna normalize for a, a hell of a long time. Coinbase is laying off 18% of its staff as cryptocurrencies tank. The company said that it's gonna re reduce its workforce by 1,100 employees. If you don't know what Coinbase is, it's, it's kind of like the, uh, I think they want to be like the Facebook of crypto. They want to be, you know, synonymous with crypto, exchange, uh, crypto exchanges and they wanted to be, and we actually accept Coinbase at our store, they want to be like the interact of, of crypto. Um, uh, a service that allows you to buy stuff online basically anywhere with cryptocurrency, okay? And uh, they're laying off 18% of their staff. And, you know, doing that the day after crypto crashes is probably going to be a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. All right. Uh, somebody has reminded me about the national chlorine shortage, which is still a thing. We talked about this about a month ago. Still an issue. And, I mean, what is not? We got baby formula. We got sriracha and hot sauce. I mean, everything's in a shortage. Apparently, I didn't know this, but oil spikes on reports that Libya shuts down nearly all of its oil fields. Libya is one of the world's uh, biggest exporters of oil, far less so than the, the biggest players, but still a fairly significant one. And Libya is losing oil production at the rate of 1.1 million barrels daily. Almost all of the country's oil fields have been shut down. It is currently in the throes of yet another flare-up of violence, which is not surprising because, you know, it, it's bread war time. It's time for another, uh, what did they call it, Arab Spring, or, you know, this is what happens when the price of food gets too high. And these are all net importing countries for food. The North African country is already producing about 600,000 barrels per day in May due to the large field and a export terminal closures and now based on Ayun's comments its output rate is close to a hundred thousand the impact of such outages on international prices could have been significant were it not for the fact that outages in Libya are frequent and latest news from China about the economic slowdown there now Saudi Arabia has apparently given Biden the cold shoulder on the fuel issue because you got to think you know the Saudis they're making money right now why would you want to why would you want to give more oil to the markets when it would just mean that you're giving, you know, less and less, you're, you're giving more for less, right? And they know that the writing is on the wall for oil. I mean, there's maybe a few decades left where they're going to, where that's going to be a, a lucrative source of income that they can fuel their Lamborghinis with. Now, this is a big concern, fertilizer, okay? I was talking with the soulless soil scientist over at Gardening in Canada yesterday. And uh, 
talking about the importance of fertilizer. Because we're planting, you know, stuff and, you know, often people think about light. They think about water, obviously. Uh, but fertilizer is so important. The soil that you have is only good for maybe two or three seasons at best without being rejuvenated by some uh, form of compost or manure or something like that. Without it, it's just dead soil. It's just dead sand. Fertilizer is what feeds the planet. Okay, And the price of fertilizer has doubled since 2021. Uh, the National Corn Growers Association predicts that its members will spend 80% more on fertilizer in 2022 on synthetic fertilizers than they did in 2021. This is going to add an additional $130,000 cost per farm. Now, the Department of Agriculture has said that they're going to invest $500 million to try to lower fertilizer costs by increasing production. But since this probably isn't enough money to construct new fertilizer plants, it's not clear how this money will be spent, <coughs> wasted. The U.S. should also provide support for natural-based solutions, including farming practices that help farmers reduce or forego synthetic fertilizers and biological products. Uh, the big three macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, this is what plants need to grow. Farmers can fertilize their fields by planting crops that add nitrogen to the soil. We talked about that with Solis. She was talking about the... The beans, how they put uh, nitrates back into the soil, nitrogen back into the soil. Excess fertilizer, however, washes off to fields during storms and runs off into rivers and lakes. There it fertilizes huge algae blooms that die and decompose, depleting oxygen in the water, creating dead zones that can't support fish or other aquatic life. This process, called eutrophication, is a major problem in the Great Lakes, the Chesapeake Bay, the Gulf of Mexico, and many other U.S. water bodies. Um, one reason why U.S. fertilizer prices have spiked is that farmers are beholden to imports, COVID-19, disrupted supply chains, especially from China, a major fertilizer producer, and now the war in Ukraine has cut off access to potash, an important potassium source from Russia and Belarus. And this is why our province, our premier, is thinking about giving people uh, some kind of tax rebate because the price of potash has skyrocketed. So our province is laughing because get this, our province has the most uranium in the world. I think we have one of the largest supplies of potash in the world. And we're one of the biggest grain producers in the world. And I think we have a, a fairly sizable amount of oil in the province as well, among other things. So this, you know, this might be Saskatchewan's time to shine. Put us on the map. Um, there's electricity costs just soaring around the world. I mean, there's an article here about electricity costs in uh, Illinois as a result of the shutdown or the looming shutdown of coal plants. Now, they're saying, okay, we want to go carbon neutral by 2050. This is causing some coal producers to not want to upgrade their systems in order to them, for them to become operational because they think that they're just going to get shut down. So they don't. So... Uh, a lot of uh, Illinois is going to be at risk of power outages. And of course, as the mercury rises, that's going to uh, cause people to use, want to use more and more power uh, to air condition their homes. Lake Mead continues to shrink before our eyes. It's now at 29% capacity. There's a YouTube channel on here that's kind of gone viral. He shows, you know, the state of, of Lake Mead and it's, it's basically uh, nothing, a shell of its former self. Record flooding forces the closure of Yellowstone Park. There's also uh, record flooding in Turkey right now. Uh, half of Australia braces for mass power outages and desperate operators beg people to be a bit thoughtful with their heaters in Aircon. Because remember now in Australia, it's technically winter there. I think their winter is kind of like our spring here. <clears throat> Millions of Aussies are being warned to brace for mass blackouts on Tuesday night as freezing temperatures and a national shortage of power create a perfect storm for the grid. We're hearing a lot about this now, more and more than ever before, aren't we? Like you never used to hear about this kind of stuff. I mean, well, why are we just hearing about this now? 
You know, it's, uh, this is, I, I guess it's because the shit's hitting the fan. The recent polar surge, which has brought freezing temperatures to most of Australia, has placed abnormal pressure on the power grid as Aussies blast their heaters and air conditioners to stay warm. I'm not sure. I think this might be a translated article. Uh, the, or maybe they call air conditioners heaters in Australia. I don't know. The increased pressure on the power grid has been compounded by unreliable coal power plants and generators powered down after AMO ordered a price cap on soaring energy prices. The European energy crisis will only get worse, according to Dmitry Medvedev, the former Moscow president. Today, they are experiencing an energy crisis, the scope of which will only increase. Even the main instigator of anti-Russian aggression the U.S. has suffered, Medvedev stated, likely referring to the spike in gasoline prices in the U.S., India's wholesale prices soar 15.8% in May. Excessive heat spurs warnings for more than 100 million Americans. Guys, what can I say? Just keep on prepping. That's all you got to do. You know, keep on gardening. We're going to go do a tour of a store on the brighter side of things. I'll tell you a bit about what's coming up on the channel. We're going to be touring this store that I did not know about. And they have so much preparedness stuff in this store uh, it gave me a lot of really good ideas so we're going to take you guys on a tour of that place and we're also going to be heading out to our copia family uh, freeze-dried foods and most of you guys who watch the channel for a while uh, know dean he has his own youtube channel our copia and he's got, he's the guy with a passive solar greenhouse but we're actually going to be doing a video on homestead security and I tell you, that guy has a lot of tips and tricks. I mean, everything from freaking moats to uh, multi-layered like uh, perimeter defenses, and it, it's really cool. So you guys are going to want you're going to like that video. Uh, it's a bit more blue strip than a lot of these videos. What else are we talking about? More gardening stuff. We're going to be uh, doing a video, probably releasing tomorrow about uh, inflation, which is a bit more of a higher production video we got some gear reviews coming up we're going to be testing out the new mobile starlink platform we got some wind turbines that we are testing out we're going to be talking about solar power in greater detail how you can get solar on your home we've talked a lot about portable solar before we're going to be talking to an expert about solar we've got a peter pry interview i'm going to be talking to a climate scientist on the channel and uh, we're just going to be, you know, we're going to be talking about stuff, you know, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see what she has to say about some things. I know it's a bit of a contentious issue in our neck of the woods, but, uh, you know, I mean, the shit's going down. So, you know, we got to approach it. We can't just make it a taboo topic that we, that we don't address at all, because clearly it's, uh, you know, things, issues are mounting and we need to confront it head on. What else do we got planned? Yeah, we got lots of nifty little gear reviews planned. We're going to be doing something with beekeeping pretty soon. So just the list goes on. I mean, freeze drying, we're going to be freeze drying the crap out of stuff. Uh, and of course, sharing you guys, uh, sharing our experience with the indoor gardening, which is proving to be challenging, but I think it's going to be worthwhile in the end. We also have an outdoor garden that we're trying to maintain. We're going to do some fishing videos. Yeah, the list goes on, guys. So, you know, it's I like uh, what Dr. Bones and Nurse Amy say, doom and bloom. And they got this really cool logo. It's a mushroom cloud, but on the other, uh, on the out, outer layer of the mushroom cloud, it's a tree. So I like that philosophy. It's, it's not just doom and gloom. It's doom, or maybe gloom, doom and bloom how about that and then boom doom no let's see it would be doom gloom boom and then bloom <laughs> this video has went on way too long enough as it is you guys take care stay tuned we got a lot more good stuff coming for you canadian prepper out